Lord, I pray that you would give me the words to speak that can help your people. Lord, give me understanding so that your words are clear, so that even as your word declares, as people would gather together to hear your word, that they would rejoice because they received understanding. Let this be, Lord, help right now. In Jesus' holy name, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. In the book of Habakkuk, or it can also be pronounced Habakkuk, whichever way you want to do it, there is no problem. But the title of the message is what I'm going to stress again and again because of what God has placed on my heart. Last week, I spoke on praying Psalm 91 because the enemy would like nothing more than to silence our words, to silence our heart. I am determined that ain't going to happen. Not going to happen. We must speak the name of Jesus. There is power in that name. We have been given power and authority in the name of Jesus. And when we speak the name of Jesus, something has to happen. That's Bible. My word shall not go forth and not do what it was sent to accomplish. Amen? It cannot, do you hear me? It cannot return void. Plain and simple. So when we pray God's promises, when we pray, Lord, this is what I know. Help me to believe something has to happen. So the title of the message today is yet an emphasis on those three letters. Yet I will rejoice. It's going to reflect the hope and the determination that the Lord has placed on my heart in this season that reflects a no matter what kind of mindset. The message today is one of understanding the holy consecration that must be in each of our lives as we see the signs of the times quickly moving this world into events that could very easily bring things to an end just like that. Turn with me to that first book there, to our first Verses in Habakkuk 3 and verse 18. Read with me. It says, starting back up to verse 17. Habakkuk 3 and 17. Are you with me? Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Stop there a minute. Sounds bleak, does it not? Sounds tough, does it not? It sounds challenging, am I right? Though all of these things, though all of these things may be happening, verse 18, yet. Come on. Yet I will rejoice 
in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Come on, let's give him a hand. Then I will declare yet, no matter what, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. I will joy. I will rejoice. Hallelujah. Even as we turn to the first part of that chapter, 3 in Habakkuk. Habakkuk is just one of the 12 minor prophets. You don't hear his name or anything else referred to about Habakkuk except that book. Which means it wasn't about Habakkuk. Okay? It wasn't about that prophet. What it was about was bringing the word of the Lord in that time for those people. And at the beginning of chapter 3 of Habakkuk, it begins... And it says in verse 2, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. This is a prayer coming from Habakkuk. Verse 3, a verse that always made me stop, ponder, and wonder. It says, God came from Timon, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. Selah, when you see that in the written word, generally was meant as a musical instrument signed to rest. Those of you that are musicians, there are rests, I think. I don't understand it at all. Don't read music. But there are rests that you stop. Am I right? Selah, in the word, stop. Go back and read what you just read. Verse 3 says, God came from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Many times I would go back to that word and a fearful awesomeness would come over me. A holy fear of God. Because each and every one of us, come on, you, you know that in the apologetics of understanding the truth of God's Word, that subject comes up. Well, if God made all things, where did God come from? That's natural stuff. We would look at it. We would think. And believe me, I don't have an answer. I'm not preaching a message today about where God came from. But when I read that verse, when I stop and look at what it says, I understand through the Spirit that God is almighty. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. God is all in all. What I understand is that God is going to be the one that answers for himself because he's God. And all I have to do is, as we heard this morning, give my heart, give my obedience, and keep pressing into the doors that are open before us. Can I get an amen? Continuing in verse 3, it says, His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise verse 4 and his brightness was as the light he had horns coming out of his hand <laughs> and there was the hiding of his 
power. Skip down to verse 6. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. Oh, our God is big. Oh, our God is wonderful. And yeah, I don't and cannot, I don't have the words to tell you where God came from, but I know He lives right here in my heart. What are we going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? When these words come out, when these words are spoken by a prophet in that day, it was during a time of declaring judgments, prophesying of what was going to happen to the children of Israel just before the Chaldeans overtook the nation, Babylonian. This was the time. This was the stuff that was happening during that time. And Habakkuk is expressing to us that even if in these end times, even if in these times when the enemy will come in like a flood, and even when all of the fields will be bare, when the stalls of the calving, there will be none, when the olive tree, all of it, when everything looks very hard. Yet, hear me, yet, doesn't matter, yet, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Hallelujah! This is what is being spoken. Even if we go back to Habakkuk uh, chapter 2, you can see he maintained his position. He wasn't interested in understanding where he stood among all of the other minor prophets or major prophets. He was there to speak the word. Chapter 2, go with me to the first verse. It gives us the warning of things to come. It says, I will stand upon my watch. Do you hear this now? Get instruction. Here is a time where this one man of God, it can be a woman, it can be a child, where you stand in your place upon your watch. And it says, and I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. And I will watch to see what he will say unto me. Wait to hear what the Lord will say. My sheep hear my voice, amen. And what I shall answer when I am reproved. He said, I will do what it takes to stand and pray and know my God hears. He will answer. I will pray. I will stand. I will set me on in the tower where my place is, and I will watch. And then I will wait to hear what he says. And that's where the Lord gives an answer in verse 2 of chapter 2. Read with me. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make a plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. There's a time, there's a season that we are in right now that can very easily lull us to a complacency or a lethargic state. You know what I'm saying? A very dangerous place to be. Because we seem to be as much 
I guess that's possible, at peace. Everything seems to be flowing. Everything seems to be prosperous. Everything seems to be okay. I'm working, okay? Kids are growing up. Hey, everything's going fine. Yeah. But there is a season coming, a time coming, where that vision, what God has spoken about what is to take place in these end times will come and it will surely come and it won't tarry. And if we are not ready, you remember the parable of the ten bridesmaids, right? Five had extra oil. Five figured, hey, I'm good. Okay, I got time. I mean, hey, the wedding's supposed to happen, you know, at three o'clock. You know, I don't need, I don't need extra stuff here. Five were wise, five were foolish. Does that, that say it in the word, right? And when the bride delayed, when it seemed like things weren't quite happening as quick as I thought it would be, how many of us have been there thinking, there's no way that I'm going to start drawing Social Security? <laughs> Jesus will have returned by then. Guess what? I'm drawing Social Security, okay? Hallelujah! <laughs> Think how the enemy so subtly wants to take what you have and try to diminish that fire. That's complacency. That's where in Revelation where it talks about losing your first love, that's what we're talking about dangerous place to be. Habakkuk says, listen, I'm going to stand. I'm going to be in my watch. I'm going to be in my place. I'm going to pray. I'm going to support. I'm going to encourage. I'm going to surround myself with those that will do likewise. And I will see God's vision come to pass. Don't ever, ever let the enemy make you think that God is not working on your behalf because at a time when things quickly will come it will not tarry we must be ready we must have that extra oil with us can I get an amen yet yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will joy in the God of my salvation we know that perilous times will come upon the earth. It says so in 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. Turn with me. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Listen, how it describes what perilous times will be. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and we're not done yet, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. It keeps going. Traitors, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That is like taking a Polaroid camera shot, if you know what those were. That's what we're in. This is our time. These were prophesied and spoken that in the last days perilous times shall come. There will be things happening. Will we be ready? 
And we also know that it's written in Romans 8 and verse 35 that even as those times quickly coming, as we see the days approaching, Romans 8, 35 encourages us and says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? It could go on. Or infirmity or COVID, or scoliosis, or diverticulitis, or any illness, or any cancer, or anything that shall afflict your body, shall any of this separate us from the love of Christ. I'm talking to you. Yet. I will rejoice in the Lord, the hope of my salvation. There is nothing that is going to separate us from the love of Christ. That verse, yet, that word, yet, gives us the hope and the ability to stand And he even goes on to say in verse 37 of Romans 8, Nay, in all these things, what are we? Hmm. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Family of God, what price truly do we have that we can even begin to comprehend in our minds of the love that Jesus Christ has for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, for you and me. So, for what reason? So that we might have life. That we might have it more abundantly. That's where I'm directing you. This is where I'm telling you, put your hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to that next screen, please, and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Here we get a glimpse firsthand of even a prominent disciple like Peter. Having to make changes to turn things around in his life. I love Peter because each one of us can identify with the turnarounds that we've had to make in our own lives. Are we, are we truthful? Yeah? Okay. You see, Peter got what it meant to have a yet because of all the things that... <laughs> He, can I say it, screwed up, okay? Yet, Peter turned it around, yet. He said, I'll get this right, okay? It says in verse 31 of Luke 22, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, that was Peter, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. (laughs) Verse 32, but I have prayed for you that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. That's a word for all of us. When we have turned things around, as we have surrendered our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's when we have to turn it back, strengthen the brethren. Following these verses in Luke that we just read, Peter replies to Jesus 
that he's ready to go to prison and to death. Read the word. Go back to it yourself. Luke 22, read. Jesus said, I'm ready to go to prison. I'm ready to die for you, Jesus. And Jesus had to reveal to Peter, Peter, before the cocks even crow this morning, you will have denied me three times. Sometimes a reset is needed in our lives. Like what happened to Peter. You see, sifting as wheat was a process that was well understood. They understood those words when Jesus spoke them because in that day as wheat or other grains were harvested, the chaff was the loose outer covering on wheat and other grains that had to be separated in the threshing and the winnowing process of harvesting grain. In Bible times, the grain was harvested by uh, threshing or trampling, crushing, beating on outdoor threshing floors to separate out the inedible parts of the grain called the chaff. The lightweight chaff would blow away in the wind or sometimes was burned up as fuel. But in the winnowing process, grain was then tossed into the air, allowing the wind to further separate any remaining bits of the husk from the wheat so that only the kernel of grain was left there. We see that even referred to in Psalm 1 and verse 4, talking about the ungodly. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. You see, even in the New Testament, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is portrayed by John the Baptist as the winnower of, or the harvester of grain. It says in Matthew 3, verse 11 and 12, I indeed baptize you, this is John the Baptist speaking, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will truly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Here we see it, that the chaff is no good for anything but to be burned. But honestly, chaff isn't always associated with evil. It could just be unnecessary. Hear me now. You've got a grain of wheat that's wrapped around with this chaff. What was it doing? It was simply there to protect that kernel until such time as it was ready to harvest. When the time came for things to happen and that harvest had to come forth, listen now, the chaff simply had to be removed. Many times we've got unnecessary chaff that needs to be removed in our lives. Things that are holding us down, things that are preventing us from getting that true fruit, that abundance to come forth. Weights, things that, that happen, life, things like what we are talking about in the very first verses of all of the troubles and the temptations. They just need to be removed. The chaff needs to be pulled off so that we can expose the true uh, grain or kernel of our heart there. Go to that next screen there. We've heard it said before. You can only live where you've died. 
which simply means surrender the things, the unnecessaries, the, the weights that would hold you down. Because Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 24, verily, verily, except a corn of wheat, the grain, fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. And we know he was making, he was making this statement in response to those that were pressing to see him. They wanted to see Jesus. He, he prophesied of himself in answering them and saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified, which gives us the understanding that Jesus knew that unless he died, unless he made himself as that appointed sacrificial lamb, that the fruit of what his death would be accomplishing couldn't be manifested here. His was a physical death. Ours is a spiritual death. We die to ourselves. Am I making sense? In Romans 5 and verse 2, it begins and it says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Uh-oh. Really? I've got to fulfill that too? We glory in tribulations also? It's the word. Knowing, keep reading. That's always the most important part. You get stopped, keep reading. Keep moving. Keep plowing ahead. Knowing that this also, that tribulation works patience. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Okay, there's a key right there. Through it all, yet, <laughs> yet, I will rejoice. Even through tribulation, even through trouble, even through anything life throws at me, yet, I will rejoice because the Holy Ghost is working in me because I am more than a conqueror through him that loves me. Amen? Verse 8, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can I get an alleluia? Because that's where we were. You weren't born saved. Okay? You had to make, you have to make a decision to make him your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But God commanded his love toward us and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood. Listen, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Promise. Word of God. Truth. Life verse. Go back and read it. It's there. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's a big amen. I'll say it myself. Amen. Next screen. Wrapping up. That's why in James 1, verse 2, we can say, my brethren... Counted all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting 
nothing. Can I say this? Sometimes, speaking for myself, we can start thinking that when things come against us, an illness, COVID, infirmity, anything, name it, that we immediately start beating ourselves up and experiencing the condemnation that comes from who? The enemy. Because God does not condemn us. And that insecurity of what happened, why, draws us back to his word. To a verse like Habakkuk 3.18 that says, Yet. I will rejoice in the hope of my salvation. You see, insecurity like that can be used by God. Don't get me wrong here in thinking that God is causing accidents and trouble. I'm talking about things that God can use in your life that can help you to understand that that area, this area, needs to be strengthened or improved or you need to eliminate what you're doing here. It causes you, am I making sense, to go back to the Word and say, Lord, open my heart. Examine me, O Lord. Try my reins, Lord. Prove me and see the Word speaks if there be any wicked way in me and go back to the word and let there be a strengthening of what chaff needs to be removed so that you can bear much fruit as the word says we are able to amen verse 13 understand this in the same chapter james 1 let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. That's why it says in Psalm 18 and verse 30, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. So let me end today with just a couple of verses because the whole point this morning is to admonish you, to enable your thinking, to encourage you that our God always will reign. And He is the one that we will seek after. When Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, my instructions to you are seek. You seek. It says seek ye first. You, me, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, whatever things, our needs, whatever desires, whatever it is, will just simply be added to us. That's God's word. That's his promise. But in 1 Peter, it also talks in this manner. Chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Can I get an amen? Come on. It's not like some strange thing that there would be a tribulation, a trial. It happens. It's called life. But thank God we've got the greater one in us to overcome. But rejoice, it goes on in verse 13, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding 
joy. Finally, in Psalm 46, let's put that verse, if we can, up on the screen. Verse 1 through 5 of Psalm 46. If we can put it up there, I'm going to read it. This is what we're going to end with today. Psalm 46, 1 through 5, it says, God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear. Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah, there it is, stop, look back, don't read any further, go back, and reread. Verse 4 says, There's a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. That's God's Word. That's the truth of His Word. Yet, yet, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if I am not working right now and I'm having to, you know, get through some physical stuff. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I am having moments where I'm wondering, why did this happen, Lord? Why did this take place in my life? Come on. These are just real things. They're present. What are we going to do with it? Take it back to the Word. Yet I will hope. In the rejoice, I will rejoice. I will be glad. There's a whole lot more. We could keep going on this word here this morning. We'll bring out more again. But that's what the Lord has for us this morning. Take that solid foundational word and write it upon the tables of your heart. Because God cannot fail. Men can stumble. Men can fail. But God cannot He said, is is God able to do all things? Absolutely. Take it to him in prayer. Let's stand to our feet.